Christmas is a special time. It's also incredibly busy. You race from party to party, place to place, trying to get every gift and accomplish everything on your list. Sometimes I'm afraid we get caught up in the rush and we miss what really matters. A wonderful added antidote for the stress and busyness of the season is a return to the simple message of Christmas, the reason we celebrate. In the midst of all the lights and the glitz, what really matters has never changed. God sent his son Jesus as a gift to all mankind. And because Jesus came to earth, we can be forgiven, free, whole, and healed. That's a wonderful gift. This is our 15th year of family Christmas. And uh, I didn't introduce my wife a few minutes ago. <laughs> and uh, so that was about to be a really bad way to start because I wanted this special moment just for you. Instead of being lumped in with all the other introductions, I wanted you to have your own. Is it, wasn't that, did everybody feel, yeah. So no one told me that, I don't have my earpiece in, that was just me on my own remembering. This is our 15th year. When we first did it, we didn't plan on it becoming a tradition. The first year, our hearts were stirred with the needs of some precious people in our church family. We decided to surprise them in our Christmas service. And it was so meaningful, we decided to do it again the next year. And again, it was super meaningful. And a tradition was born. I'm generally worried about creating new traditions because they're hard to stop. They can become something you do not because it's meaningful or effective, but just because it's something you do. The family Christmas is still both meaningful and effective, and it's grown. Individuals, businesses, families, ministry groups, connection classes, all plan and bless and give to bless those in need to celebrate difference makers in our church. Uh, even people from outside our church give and attend live and online to be part of family Christmas. So welcome to everybody that's watching online tonight. Every gift you see given... All four services was funded by an individual or group as a result of God speaking to their heart. There's always people who say, well, that's not possible. How could people give that or how could they give that much? When you're committed to a generous life and putting others first, anything's possible. There are almost as many cool stories of people giving as there are people receiving. They've sacrificed in response to God's prompting and allowed me the privilege of giving their gifts. So thank you. Thank you for loving and for giving. Every once in a while, someone will say, well, that's too much. Why would you bless one person or one family with all that? Well, here's the fun thing. I don't dictate how much or what people give to bless others. I can't ever imagine saying to somebody, no, I think you've given too much. I let the Lord direct them, and I celebrate radical generosity, and I invite you to celebrate that with me. And let me make something clear. We reach out and care for people all year long. We don't let a family stay hungry so we can feed them at family Christmas. We're not cruel and stingy so we can have one day to give. Uh, you just heard Ashton say on the, on the video, you shared over 5,000 bags of groceries this year, which is incredible. And, and I wish I had time to just tell you all the stories of people who have been blessed by the food you bring. Thank you. Thanks for sharing clothes and food and furniture and cars and appliances and funds all year long. Generous, generously caring for others shouldn't just happen at Christmas. Well, from my earliest Christmas memory, my family always sat around the living room and listened as my dad opened the big green living Bible and read the Christmas story. And after Dad read the Christmas story, we opened gifts. I'm going to do it a little different. We're not going to wait till I'm done reading for gifts. Instead, we're going to open some special gifts as we read the Christmas story. Uh, the family Christmas team started working on today, the week before last year's family Christmas. Spent a lot of time thinking and praying, asking God to lay on their hearts and the hearts of others, people to bless and help. Will we meet every need in this service? Of course not. That's not possible. There's a lot of giving going on. We just don't have time to highlight it in all four services. 
Uh, I encourage you, celebrate needs being met, and know that God has you in mind as well. If his eye is on the sparrow, I know he's watching over you. So, tonight, from the books of Matthew and Luke, we want to read the Christmas story. I reserve the right to interrupt a few times. Uh, We have to move rather fast in the service, so if we miss elements of the Christmas story that you love, I apologize in advance. There's a Bible that's available for you. It's underneath the chair in front of you. It's our gift to you. I'll give you the references, so if I miss your favorite part, you can go back and you can read it. All right, let's start reading. Uh, Parker, why don't you start reading in Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Which would have been a disaster for Mary. Joseph faced public disgrace. Mary faced being a single mom in a day when women didn't work. If Mary wasn't married, she would have no way to provide for herself and her soon coming child. There's no doubt still a huge challenge to be a single mom. One of our core values is every soul matters to God. Every soul, regardless of social standing, financial position, age, race, religious background, we love single moms. We're committed to walking with them through the parenting process. Matter of fact, after the 1130 service tomorrow, uh, we will be hosting 217 single moms and their children for our annual Christmas lunch. It's, it's our biggest ever. I still remember the first one. I think we had 11 or 12. 217. That's, that's a lot of food, a lot of kids. If you, if you don't have anything to do tomorrow afternoon, uh, we have room for you to help in the nursery or preschool. Um, Emily, you want to pick it up right there where, where I interrupted him? But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 2. We're rocking through the story. Ashton, you want to pick it up there? Chapter 2, verse 1 of Luke. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Jesus was born in a manger, which is not really what you expect for the Son of God. Jesus came not in a castle, but to a simple manger in Bethlehem as an ordinary man, God's gift to us. From the very beginning, Jesus set the example of humility and sacrifice. I want to introduce you to a leader and his family who set that same example. Incredible sacrifice and love for others, all done from a humble, caring heart. And I want to invite Benjamin Egby, we call him Benji, his wife Tekla, and their daughter Catherine to come up here and join me on the platform. Come on up here, Benji. Now, Benji and Tekla have never seen a family Christmas service, and Pastor Randy has told some horrible lies to them to get them here. Come on up here, Pastor Benji. He's got his Bible. He's ready to preach. (laughs) Leave me room. I'm sitting down too. All right. I'll kind of set up this story for you here. Several years ago, we were approached by the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Cameroon known there as the Full Gospel Mission. He shared the story of a group of Cameroonian pastors who'd come to the U.S. and planted churches among Cameroon immigrant populations. And he asked us if we would adopt them into our church family and lead them as they transition to the U.S. Assembly of God and begin ministering to people beyond Cameroonians. That began a long story and some rich, beautiful relationships. The churches are across the United States, from California to New England, 
uh, Benji and Tekla, pastor of the Full Gospel Mission Church in Palestine, Texas. Uh, and I just want to tell you their story for a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> Benji's a big guy, and he's not happy with me right now. <laughs> Benji and his wife work for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. They also have opened a grocery store in Palestine, Texas. In addition to that, they're pastors. Uh, this weekend, they celebrate their second anniversary as a church. And in that time, the church has grown to almost 50 people, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. The story is unique. Benji purchased a small piece of land with a rundown garage on it. It was in shambles. And over the course of months, using his own money, with just his wife and kids as the construction crew, Benji turned that old garage into a church. Uh, not everyone was excited about it. It's a tough story, but one that illustrates the difficulty and challenges they faced. Um, Benji and his daughters put the roof on the church in August in Texas. <laughs> and the water hadn't been turned on at the church yet. And they're working up on the roof. It's 100 plus degrees. The girls were getting lightheaded and exhausted. So Benji sent his then 15, 12, and 10-year-old kids across the street to the neighbor's house to see if they could get a drink from the hose. And the person who lived there used a racial slur towards the girls and called the police rather than share water. Um, I could tell you more stories about what they faced, but it just make you angry. By the way, that neighbor isn't there anymore. Benji, instead of responding with anger, prayed her out. Um, which, if you need a neighbor prayed out, see Benji right after, <laughs> after this service, and he'll believe with you for that old grouchy person to move. There's also some funny stories, uh, some cultural stuff. Africans like their music and their preaching really loud. A matter of fact, they don't believe it's loud enough unless there's distortion coming from the speakers. <laughs> And uh, it's true, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's quite an experience. Um, and you can imagine how their prejudiced neighbor responded to that. Which my advice was keep turning it up. Maybe she'll come into the kingdom. And, or leave, which she did. Through it all, Benji remained positive and loving and faithful to the call of God. When it would have been easy to respond to the anger and hate and prejudice by leaving, they stay in obedience to the Lord. Uh, Pastor Randy leads our ministry with the Cameroonian churches. A few weeks ago, I asked him to go down to Palestine to visit Benji, yeah. but he was really on assignment to learn how, he, how we could help. Wow. Yeah, it was a lie. <laughs> and um, but before we get there, we've got, we want to give your daughter some gifts today. Would that be all right, Catherine? We got some presents for you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to give her a little space. Parker, Tyler. All right. Catherine, uh, I think the way this works, open the big one first. There you go. There you go. Yeah, you're good. Okay, that's going to have to go quicker than that, Catherine. Go. go. Rip it. Oh, it's a slip. It's a Nintendo slip. Yes, it is. Okay, open the other stuff. You're welcome. Faster, baby. I love you, but rip. It's controllers. You've got to have the controllers to go with the switch. Super Mario. 
Super Mario, all right, love that game. Catherine, I wanted to buy you a new pair of sneakers, but I knew there's no way I could figure that out. So she said, really? And I said, no way I could figure that out. She went, oh. <laughs> so here's a $150 Adidas <laughs> gift card for you. And I wanted to buy you some clothes, but I couldn't figure that out. So here's a $150 Visa gift card for you. There you go. And then, Benji and Tecla, we know you have some other kids who are uh, in a college prep class today. You don't have to stand up. Sit down, man. We're not done. Sit down. Benji, sit down. I love this guy. We, we, went, to, we went to district council to meetings together, and we laughed so much. It was, we have, for each of the kids, $150 Adidas gift cards for each of your other three kids. And $150 Visa gift cards for each of the three kids so that they can shop. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. And so I want to show you um, some pictures of the church. Here, I got Kleenexes up here, Tecla. I want to show you some pictures of the church. Here's what it looked like at the beginning. Here's what it looks like now. Isn't that awesome. And uh, I love the name for the building on the outside. It, say, it doesn't just say church, it says Arena of Testimony. Yeah. I love that, brother. When Pastor Randy went, and we were looking for how we could help, the answer was clear children's ministry. Um, really challenging. They, they currently have a very small room without lighting or electricity uh, right next to the platform. And because there's not lights, they have to open the door so the kids can see, but it's right next to the platform so all the noise from the kids' room comes into the sanctuary. Um, it's really challenging. And it's important for you to remember, this church is brand new, and most of the members are new immigrants to the States. So there aren't excess funds. Uh, Benji receives no salary as pastor. In fact, he pays most of the expenses out of his own pocket. Uh, he financed the building and the renovations on his credit card because no bank would loan money to a church plant without uh, any track record. So he put $66,000 on credit cards and now you've paid off in two years. No, we're not done. We're you've paid off like 30, About 30%. 30 percent of it. So it, it's amazing. Uh, Benji, we wanted to do something to, to help your church. And so we have several things for you today. First, we have an entire basket of curriculum for your kids' ministry. This is, how many years will that be, Pastor Brian? That's three years' worth of curriculum for your kids' ministry, high-voltage stuff. <laughs> then, a lot of that curriculum is video-driven and stuff like that, and the kids' church needs a TV for the wall so the kids can watch all the videos. <laughs> and... All the, we got all the mounting and the connections. Is that what all that is, Parker? And the DVD, and the DVD player, all that. And then again, it's all, a lot of it's fired on video, so something else they need in order to make all this happen is, uh, we'll let you go ahead and just get that. It, it's, it's. That would be a laptop computer for the kids' ministry so they can fire all the videos and everything. <laughs> and 
And uh, then we, Benji, we spent a lot of time just sit down. <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking and praying about the best thing we could do to help the church. And uh, we decided what we're going to do tonight is take an offering. And we want to help renovate the kids' area. Obviously, we've got to add lighting and electricity. And we want to do that. And then we want to bless the church for outreach to the community. So tonight, we're going to take an offering for the Arena of Testimony in Palestine, Texas. And we're going to make the kids' ministry area great. And then we're just believing there's going to be above and beyond to help you reach out in your community. We believe in you. We believe what you're doing. Um, the ushers are coming. I'll give you all a few moments because uh, I know I didn't give you much warning to write a check or you can put cash in an envelope. Um, you can give it through our app um, or you can give it the kiosk after service too. But we're going to count it quick and we're going to have a check for you by the end of the service. Um, but before we give, we want to pray for you. And we, we thank God for you. We know the sacrifices you've made. Um, I didn't have time tonight to tell all the stories of opposition, but I know the opposition you've faced. And, and this guy, in the midst of all that, is the most happy, joy-filled guy that you'll ever be with and never meets a stranger. When we go into restaurants together, he is just, he is the life of the party and hilarious. I, I wish I had time to give him a microphone, but he wouldn't stop, so we'd go all night. <laughs> But he is a, a, just an amazing man of God who's, who's come and is making a huge difference. And, and you and Tekla, uh, we honor you for your ministry. And we want to pray for you tonight. Pastor Andy, you want to come lead us in prayer? I know you're very close to this family. and We're going to gather around you. And, Jesus, we thank you for uncommon sacrifice. And Lord, we pray for the Egby family. They have been faithful, and you are faithful as well. Lord, I pray you would open up heaven in their spirits, that you would renew weary bodies and minds. Lord, I pray a hand of protection on their children. I pray for each one of them that you would guide them and direct them and you would use them for the kingdom. Lord, I pray for the arena of testimony that, Lord, you would yet light, light a candle of fire of the Spirit of God unlike there ever has been before. That, Lord, you would open up heaven around it. And, Jesus, I pray you would turn back the forces of evil that have tried to stop them. And instead, you would respond to the faithfulness of this man and this woman and this family. Jesus, I pray you'd provide for them in ways that they can't even imagine. God, I pray that you would use them in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray for my friends. And I pray, God, you would use them unlike you've ever used them before. Lord, I pray a blessing on this church and its people, that it would be a magnet to draw people to the kingdom of God. Lord, we pray for the Eggbees. And we're thank God, we say thank you to you that you brought them into our lives, that you could challenge us to greater levels of sacrifice. We pray it in the powerful name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. count the offering and have a check for you at the end of the service, but uh, Benji and Tekla, we also just want to bless you at, at Christmas 
And so I have you this special gift from our church family. Just this is for you. This is not for the church, okay? Because I know what you'll do. Look at me. It's not for the church. Yes, for you and Mama, we just have a gift of $500 for you. Merry Christmas, my friend. All right, we're going to see you all again at the end of the service. It's going to be fun. Oh, I was so caught up in the moment, I missed my check for the offering. Can you add my check? Thanks. Boy, I think you can sense the humble heart there, can't you? My brother and my friend. Okay, who's composed enough to read? Emily, can you do it? There's no way I can. Watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It's a key part of the story that's often missed. The angel said this will be all for all the people. The angels weren't just making a birth announcement. They were announcing a new theology, the first hint of the plan of God. And this is one of the first moments that we find out all people, everyone. As a church, we are committed to caring for others, not just ourselves. We'll be outward focused. We won't be selfish, caring only about our needs and preferences. We will not lose sight of Jesus' command to take the gospel to all people everywhere. And I want to introduce you to a young man who really lives out that value and has a remarkable heart for others. And welcome to the stage, uh, Ryan Whitfield. Where are you at, Ryan? <laughs> Ryan is the son of a single mom. Um, who also has a daughter, who would get mad if I didn't mention her, Rose, I love you. <laughs> when Ryan was eight, doctors discovered a tumor in his dad's brain. Tony was a great guy with a giving heart, highly involved in ministry. He lost his battle with cancer, but he won the war. And throughout the cancer journey, he stayed positive and faith-filled and pointed people to Jesus. Still, after Tony's death, Ryan struggled with anger. He really didn't know who to be mad at. Uh, his dad, doctors, himself, God, struggled with his temper. Um, but over time, God began to soften his heart. And men in this church, Royal Ranger leaders, his class pastors, pastors on our staff, all stepped in to fill the void. And he's got a lot of godly father figures in his life. Ryan's a hard worker. He's always here to help us. This summer, he spent a day a week in a discipleship group led by our facilities director, Joey Pewitz, where the group worked on church building projects and learned how to serve and share their faith and pray. Twelve years old, Ryan started to sense God calling him to missions. Pastor Gary interviewed Ryan, asked him to share some of the story. Here's some of what he said. Let me read it to you. I know God is going to use the death of my dad for his kingdom. I faced tragedy, but with God, I made it through. I want to share with others what God has done in my life. He saved me from myself, from anger. He saved me from deep hurt and despair. He filled a huge hole in my heart. There's no way I could have made it through that time without God. I'm so thankful my dad brought me to this church, taught to me to be a man of God with the little time we had together. I don't ever want to waste time not sharing the things he shared with me. I've already led a couple of friends and neighbors to a relationship with God. 
I can't wait to share God's love with whoever and wherever he sends me. I'm ready. Uh, Ryan, some people who love you have some special gifts for you today. We know this summer you're planning to go to Africa with reality. And so we have some things to help you with your trip. Pastor Parker's bringing them. I'm going to, let's see, maybe you can. All right. So you got to have a suitcase, the right size to have on the plane. Pick it up here because there's some stuff in it. So let's open it up and see what you got. Sensing a theme tonight. All right, let's just keep opening here. I'm going to chip in. (laughs) Too many zippers. Uh, Yes. He said too many zippers. I'm agreeing right now. All right, let's see what all is in here. Oh, Merrill's shoes. Love them. Oh, that's the perfect Africa hat. Go ahead, put it on. Let's check it out. Oh, yeah. Definitely the Africa hat. It's perfect. All right. Good lightweight stuff because it's going to be, in Zanzibar, it's going to be 95 degrees with 95% humidity. You'll want those. And there's some more. Awesome. Okay, you don't have to show us all of them. That's good. All right, let's see what else we got here. We got, I was just making sure it wasn't underwear. <laughs> um, these are perfect. Some dry fit shirts, they're perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what you want there. What else? More dry fit. Man, you got like the whole, okay, pretty much if you add socks and underwear, you're good for the whole trip <laughs> right here. And please add socks and underwear um, for the good of all of us. And then, um, then we also, because you can have a carry-on and a backpack. And these, this is like a unique, one-of-a-kind backpack that I really like. If you don't, I'll buy it from you because <laughs> I would like to have it. And then there's something in the backpack, too, so check that out. For the sake of video from now till you're an adult, I'm just going to take that hat off because I love you. I'm taking that off. And the, uh, the, the card inside the box lets Ryan know that the rest of his trip to Africa has been paid. Also, also all the money for your passports, shots, visas, everything. Ryan's been working and working extra to save his own money to pay for the trip. And uh, paid in full, my friend. I love you. He's whispered in my ear, can I still work at the church? (laughs) Yep, you're just not going to get paid. (laughs) I love you, bud. God bless you and Merry Christmas. Love you like my own. That's fun. All right. Uh, Brian, you want to pick it up there? Luke, yeah, verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Mary and Joseph experienced the same excitement and joy that all new parents feel. As a parent, more than anything, 
You want your kids to be happy, healthy, and follow Jesus. And I want to introduce you to a special family and share their story. Invite them to join me on the platform, Ryan and Crystal Darrow, and their sons, Caleb, Colin, and Caden. Come on up, guys. arranged make a little room here there's a lot of Christmas lies going on around this place uh, many of you will recognize Ryan uh, from when he taught in our elephant in the room series taught on homosexuality and gender issues it was amazing Ryan's uniquely qualified he's a licensed psychology therapist with a, he's a doctor in psychology he cares about not being called a psychologist he's a university professor and a pastor he's the only one I know who holds all three of those titles and while Ryan was here speaking uh, we learned more about this family and Ryan and Crystal a group of people who love you want to bless you uh, this Christmas obviously Ryan's a pastor so he had to plan to be here He's been in on this secret, but not his family. And uh, <laughs> the, the best part of it is uh, Crystal dropped him off and went to the hotel. And uh, when she dropped him off, she held hands with him and prayed that God would use him as he speaks tonight. <laughs> Yeah, he said, I'm speaking right now. So I asked Ryan if he'd write the story for me that gripped our hearts when we first heard it about the journey this family's on. So I'm going to read it in his words uh, because it's just better than I could say it. No parent forgets the moment their child is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The average person knows little or to nothing about this life-controlling disease. We think diet and exercise is the quick fix, which will change your child back to what he was. What caretakers don't realize is the immediate life-altering change that punches you in the face, that nothing will be the same. You stand guard, you stay up, you watch and watch, and keep watching glucose numbers rise and fall uncontrollably. Every moment, every, every hour, of every day, of every week. The expertise required is abrupt, the learning curve steep. Faithfulness is necessary. Failure is not an option. Sleep becomes a luxury. The weeks turn into months. The months turn into years, and you keep watch. As a parent, type 1 diabetes is a boulder you gladly carry. As a family, it's a burden you learn to share. As a patient, it's a never-ending life of pokes, shots, doctor's visits, blood draws, and late nights. For Colin, it all started on a Wednesday. Colin, raise your hand so they all know who you are. After several weeks of unnoticed weight loss and subtle complaints that everything was fuzzy, Ryan had a difficult time getting this then, his then three-year-old to let go of the sink from what should have been his nightly stalling to go to bed, drink of water. The gulping was sincere. The need was evident and concerning. The next day brought an anxious contact from his preschool teacher. Phone call to grandma. The nurse moved Crystal to make a same-day appointment with the pediatrician. Ryan had headed off to the church for a day of counseling while Crystal stayed home to monitor Colin's unchanged symptoms. A quick urine test and a finger poke at the doctor's office confirmed their suspicions that Colin had type 1 diabetes. Back at the church, Ryan was sitting down with his last meeting of the day when the report came through. When the call came, Crystal was sobbing. The only words she could summon were, he has diabetes. They said I should drive him straight to the hospital. Ryan replied, I'm on my way. The staff warmly welcomed them to the children's wing of the hospital, where nurses swirled around them, prepping Colin for slow stabilization. When a diabetic sugar is exceptionally high, the process of bringing it down is best done gradually. The next three days were spent in the hospital, enduring visits from what felt like every person who worked there. Six-year-old Caleb, this is Caleb on the end, was allowed to visit his brother, but Caden, there in the middle, was only six weeks old, wasn't allowed past the waiting room. All sorts of visitors helped pass the time. Mom had to tear her heart away each night to go home with the baby. Dad kept watch, watching, waiting, praying. 
the educational process continued after they were released from the hospital. For the sake of main, maintaining balanced blood sugar, Colin was quickly introduced the insulin pump, made management easier, but the mechanical device is not enough. The watching continued. In the 11 years since his diagnosis, Colin has grown into a mature, passionate, uh, empathetic young man who loves the Lord, his family, and every animal on the planet. <laughs> Ryan said, God has used this life of watching these 36,000 finger pokes to mold our family and shape our compassion. He's shown us over and over his faithfulness and compassion towards the lo those who love him and are called to his purpose. Support groups were helpful. In this new group of friends, it didn't take long for Colin to learn the idea of a diabetic service dog. Instead of constantly watching and testing, diabetic alert dogs are trained to alert their owners in advance of lower high blood sugar before they become dangerous. The dog, it's fascinating science, is trained to react to the chemical change produced by changing blood sugar levels by smells that humans can't detect. They allow the diabetic to be more confident, independent. Uh, they investigated this option, Ryan Crystal, and quickly decided it was financially impossible. And they learned to deflect Collins' questions with stuff like, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Knowing that the extreme costs associated with the purchase of a top pedigree dog and months of round-the-clock training by a professional made an impossible dream. Colin had been asking on and off about a dog over the years and then finally about six months ago he couldn't shake the idea he even chose a name for the dog they couldn't get Leopold <laughs> it wasn't long after that I called Ryan and shared with him that God had laid their family on our hearts and Colin when we found about your dream for a diabetic service dog we started dreaming too and a group of people who love you very much have provided the money to purchase Leopold. And to have him trained. We really wanted to have Leopold here tonight. But it because it would have been so amazing. <laughs> but there's training to do and you have to be trained. At the end of his training. Your, your dad has been stealing clothes, not telling Crystal that we've been... <laughs> True story, because you have to send those so the dog can learn your scent. And so there's a lot of lying going on. Um, there's training to do, and you have to be trained. So at the end of his training, Leopold and a trainer will come to your house in Kansas City uh, from the company in Las Vegas will teach you how to work with the dog and the dog how to work with you. And in a few months, you're going to have a new member of your family, Leopold. And uh, what's so fun, Ryan told me on the way here, Colin started talking about Leopold again. And, uh, and his brother, his older brother, uh, said, you know, I know it doesn't make sense. It's crazy. But how do you say it? Give him, give him the microphone, Cindy. Good. Here, 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 say it. My oldest had said uh, at one point, Collins just nonstop talked about it for the last six months. The Lord just laid it on his heart, knowing that this was all going to happen. And at one point, Caleb just said, you know, it's, you know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. He's like prophetic. He says things and stuff happens. It's crazy. It's going to happen. Well, it is going to happen, Colin. And uh, we can't wait to meet Leopold. The only rule is you got to bring him back. So we can meet him. And then, since we don't have the dog here, we also have gifts for the guys. And because uh, we wanted to bless you this Christmas. And so, for each of you boys, we have $250 in Amazon gift cards to buy your own gift because we don't know you well enough to buy your gifts. So, there you go, Colin. <laughs> guys, God bless you and Merry Christmas. Cindy's like, if you're missing socks and underwear, 
Sorry about that, man. Oh, wouldn't it have been awesome to just have the dog walk out? Yeah. Until you find out that it delays the training by months. So, Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Um, Meredith, you want to read there? Matthew chapter 2, start in verse 1. Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped. And we call these guys, the Magi, we call them wise men. Wise men. And I want to introduce you to a wise young man who's becoming even wiser and invite Micah Frisbee to join me on the platform. <laughs> Sit down. Move down a little because I know you and you're going to try to read my script. (laughs) And if you do, you get nothing. (laughs) Um, I'll make a long story short. Micah was homeschooled through high school in kind of a self-directed model. Uh, But as soon as he could, he started working in order to help his family. He's a remarkably hard worker with a good job at God's favorite restaurant, (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Unless you own a restaurant, and then I think your restaurant is God's favorite. (laughs) It's a good save right there. Um, He works hard, um, but because he works so hard, he didn't finish high school. Michael worked hard, saved money. He went with us on a student ministry trip to Zanzibar a year and a half ago. I was with him there. He was amazing. His servant's heart and his strong work ethic impressed our missionaries. They were taking me aside saying, we, we really think this kid might have a call. And we could see him on this team. And we began to talk about the possibility that the Lord could use him in missions. And Micah began to sense the Lord's call and wanted to do more, but he had a big challenge. He knew college was important in order to say yes to the Lord, but he hadn't finished high school. Now enter the next person in our story, and I want to ask her to join us on this stage, Carol Singer. Come on up here, Carol. I'm going to move over. That's all right. Come sit by you, Sheriff. Thank you, Jordan. Come on over here, Carol. The Argut Singers and Frisbees have been friends for many years. Um, both families homeschooled. They often did classes together. And a few years ago, the Argut Singers moved away. But when Roger retired, he and Carol moved back to Little Rock. And they became reacquainted with Micah at our inner city campus, Metro Worship Center. And one day, Carol asked Micah about his life goals, and Micah told her he felt the Lord calling him to the mission field, specifically Africa. And then what I, I want to read what Carol wrote, because she's been in on this with us, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> Micah said he wanted to get his GED and enroll in the college program at church. He also told me he'd taken the ACT but wasn't pleased with his score. I encouraged him to pick up a GED program, take the initial testing, and get started. After Christmas, Mike had told me he'd tested and begun the classes. His teacher was doing English, but he needed a math teacher. He told me his his math test score is very low. He asked me for help. I think you told Tyler just yesterday that you were actually, at that point, at a fifth grade level in math. Carol says, we started one Monday evening in January. Mike had worked all day and was exhausted. Our time was not good. The next day, I called Micah and told him he needed to reduce his hours at work and give math classes his priority. That meant he needed to come three days a week for at least four hours a day. He agreed that and started our journey. For the next 12 weeks, we studied together at least 12 to 15 hours a week. Uh, My favorite story 
is the morning that Micah slept in and was late. And Carol uh, practiced tough love and uh, ripped him apart and told him if he is ever late again, he would be paying for tutoring instead of free. <laughs> Were you ever late again? No. I didn't think so. <laughs> Carol said, I didn't just teach the test, but I gave him a complete algebra course. I didn't want him to ever feel inferior to any high school graduate. He did the coursework. We set our goal for taking the GED in May, so that kept us motivated. In April, I started teaching writing and then worked on science and social studies. And on May 24th, Micah passed the GED. He applied and was accepted to our campus here, Ministry Training Center, that is a fully accredited campus of both Evangel University and Southwestern Assemblies of God University. Micah still works at Chick-fil-A. In addition to that, he serves here at the church with our young adult ministry, Unite, and with Celebrate Recovery. He's not lazy. In spite of his busy schedule, he took nine hours this semester. Remember, this is a guy who didn't graduate high school. Nine hours this semester, and we found out his GPA yesterday, 3.67. And I would say, look what the Lord has done. Amen. Carol, thank you for your remarkable investment in Micah. You've truly lived out our core value that every soul matters to God. And we want to honor you today with the Every Soul Matters Award in appreciation to Carol Argetsinger. Thank you for faithfully serving and loving people. You're making an eternal difference, and you truly live out that every soul matters to God. Thank you, and we honor you today, Carol. Micah never got to experience an important part of a student's life. So, Micah, we're about to have your high school graduation ceremony, all right? So, I want you to follow Parker. We got to go quick, bud. This is the most gifts we've ever had in one service. I still got another to go, so I apologize that we're going to go a little long tonight. If that upsets you, you're hard-hearted. <laughs> um, so, Carol, you're going to be the principal in this graduation ceremony. And we have framed Micah's diploma, so there it is. All right. And uh, Pastor Brian, you're going to be, you know, like the little guy who reads the name of the graduates as they come across the stage. Yeah, do you know his middle name? Micah? Aaron. Aaron. Micah Aaron. So at That's the right, right moment, you're going to say, you'll know when the right moment is because I'll tell you. Of you'll course. say Micah Aaron Frisbee, and then you'll present him with that. We're going to do the whole thing. And yeah, you take pictures, act like the, the, mom. the mom. Yeah, well, his mom's here. So just, yeah, just, she's your friend. Good. Just take pictures, just take candid shots because you got to have shots at high school graduation. We're waiting a moment because um, they got to get, be ready. He's coming to that door. And then, uh, as is tradition, when pomp and circumstance starts, all of us will rise as we welcome the class of 2018 uh, to the stage. So I hope, I hope he knows to walk slow. You know, you know, go to the... Okay, they're ready, so pomp and circumstance can begin. Would you rise with me as we honor the class?
Jamaica, and now the moment every graduate enjoys when you have officially graduated, you move the tassel from the right side to the left side. So you now are officially a graduate. And then one more thing, it's kind of a tradition. The graduates receive a graduation present. So a group of people who love you have got together to give you a graduation present. And it is a scholarship for the full spring semester, all costs of school. <laughs> Happy graduation, graduate. <laughs> Everything really is better in teams, isn't it? I didn't hear what she was saying to him, but I bet it was a little lecture. <laughs> Let me tell you something, you better keep your grade point average up or I'm going to... Mike, Merry Christmas. By the way, that's tuition, room and board, everything for the next semester. And now I'm going to slip into dad moment, which means all the money you earn this next semester, you save for the next semester. Yep, it's kind of math class. That was fun. The wise men made a long journey, and at the end of their journey, they found Jesus. Can I see that one more time, Tyler? See what? That, what you just showed me, that text. Oh, yeah. Sorry, don't mind us. Okay, sorry. And then Math, Matthew 2.11 says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Mary held the baby in her arms. But no ordinary baby, the Son of God, the hope of the world, the Messiah. That's the first moment where Jesus was worshipped. It's the greatest story ever told, and it's real. It really happened. Still today, people's lives are changed when they encounter Jesus and discover his love. More than 2,000 years later, it's still touching and changing hearts and lives all over the world. I want to introduce you to a couple who are committed to telling the story and sharing the love of Jesus, John and Lorraine Dipple, and invite them to join me. Have a seat here, Lorraine. I want to tell you their story. John felt a call. By the way, Pastor Randy lied to you guys, too. Yeah. I, there seems to be a theme this year of Pastor Randy lying. Kind of makes me proud. John felt a call to ministry and graduated from Eastern Bible Seminary. They pastored uh, two small, struggling home missions churches in Pennsylvania. They felt, man, that's a great picture. <laughs> that's awesome. They felt called to work with churches who had very little. John and Lorraine moved to Little Rock, started attending First NLR in 1980 a decade before we moved to this location. And when, when they came here, they felt they were not called to pastor churches or be upfront leaders, but to be the ones who work behind the scenes with people who need to experience Jesus' love. And their legacy of ministry here is exactly that, an amazing legacy of reaching out in love. We had a difficult time compiling a list of everything they've done. So finally, Pastor Randy met with them and asked for their help on a sermon coming up and <laughs> he, 
<laughs> yes, she said he lied. <laughs> but it was true. He does have a sermon coming up, I'm sure. <laughs> so in the time they've been here since 1980, I want to read you what they've done. They worked in Sidewalk Sunday School. They worked in Children's Church. They taught elementary Sunday school, worked with cool kids, prison ministry, Bible quiz, Royal Rangers, Celebrate Recovery. For 30 years, John taught a Union Rescue Mission, sang in the choir, productions and musicals, served in, as an usher, worked at bridge events like Christmas laying and extravaganza, feed the homeless on Saturdays, for many years. Still, every Tuesday and Thursday morning, John joins Pastor, joins Pastor Jay for a homeless Bible study. They read the Bible with and pass out bananas to homeless guys. They've read the entire New Testament. Pastor Jay was telling me this week they're working their way through the Old Testament. He said a few of the books are pretty tough going, but and some amazing, I wish I had time for the stories. They've been young adult Sunday school teachers. They worked with the prayer team at Metro Worship Center. They've done it all. They rode the bus. They teach groups, help with feeding programs, play with kids, serve at Camp Love. They serve at Metro Worship Center uh, for Celebrate Recovery every Friday night. They may be volunteers, but they are in full-time ministry, let me tell you. And, Lorraine told Pastor Randy in a note that he gave me, um, really, we don't think we do very much in comparison to others. <laughs> I wonder which others she was comparing herself to. <laughs> We're grateful to the Lord for taking us as flawed and needy people, using us in any way he desires. Pastor Randy, when he met with them, asked them as they looked back on 38 years what brought the most joy. Lorraine said, cool kids, that working with our special needs kids is a highlight of her life in ministry. For John, it's working with homeless people and helping others see that mental disease is an illness that can be overcome. And John told the story of a man named Herb. For four years, Herb walked several miles to Metro for service every week. He had a mental illness, acted odd, was hard to love. John said Herb attended more faithfully than he or Pastor Jay did, never missed. John gave Herb a ride home every night after Metro, and he would take him to rallies to buy him dinner. And one night while he was driving, he looked over at Herb and thought, Herb looks like Jesus to me. Herb now is in a home for people with mental illness, getting the help he needs. But that, that statement, Herb looks like Jesus to me, sums up John and Lorraine. John and Lorraine, in recognition of your years of selfless service and your heart for others, it's my honor to present you with the highest honor we give as a church in the 106 year of our 106 year history of our church. Uh, as far as I can remember, this is going to be tough. I'm about to. I think this is the fifth time in 106 years it's ever been presented. Um, and it is the Lifetime Ministry Achievement Award presented to John and Lorraine Dipple in honor of your dedication and commitment to equipping others to be lifelong followers of Jesus Christ at First NLR for 38 years. Thank you for paving the way for others. We love you, and we appreciate you, and we honor you tonight. Stay seated. Please stay
have we have for you um, a basket of thank you cards from people who you minister with and to. That's going to take a while to read, so we'll not do that here right now. <laughs> and then we also have a special surprise for you. In a few minutes, 6.15, so probably about 30 minutes, you're going to have a special steak dinner in your honor at the best steakhouse in town, Sonny Williams. And uh, we invited a few special guests to join you for dinner tonight because we wanted it to be special. So welcome, John and Daisy. Uh, your kids from right here, <laughs> and grandkids, and then right behind them, you might know this guy from Northwest Arkansas. Peter is here to join you, and then if you'll look over there one more time from Kansas City, Jim and Vanessa, and your grandbaby are here too. Put away some steak, son. <laughs> Stay here. Just sit down wherever you can find a spot here, guys. They've been watching service from uh, up in the choir room, I think. Thank you. Thank you for... Uh, living a life that's a beautiful example to all of us and your family is a wonderful testimony of that as well involved in ministry and leadership we love you and we're grateful to you what began in a manger in bethlehem led to a cross a few miles away on a hill called calvary and the love of jesus expressed through his people is still touching and changing lives today <laughs> you just stay here right, right here with us because we're almost done. I want to invite Pastor Benji and Tekla to come back to the stage. And Pastor Brad, oh good, you're there. Come on up here, Pastor Benji and Tekla. Can I see it? Here, just stand right here beside me, my brother. And uh, this church family, we are your church family. You are us. <laughs> and we love you and appreciate you. And so your church family tonight to help renovate your children's room and also to help you reach out in the community. I, my whole life, I've always wanted to give away a giant check. <laughs> and so we are proud to present you with this check for $10,563.71. To God be the glory. Here you go, my friend. Turn around, turn around. Give him all the glory. We'll give him all the glory. 
Pastor Benji, Pastor Benji, would you do me a favor? We're done. But would you pray a prayer of blessing over this year church family? And you pray our benediction and a blessing. Would you please? Here, I'll hold this. Father, 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 thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor. I give you all the worship. For to, to you alone belong all the glory. To you alone belong all the honor. To you alone belong all the worship. Yes, Lord. Lord, I say thank you. Thank you for this wonderful family. Thank you for this wonderful honor that you have bestowed upon me. Thank you, Father. Lord, I have loved words, but I said to you belong the, all the glory. Yes, sir. To you belong all the honor for that which you have done. Bless your people. Bless your people. May you be gracious upon your people. May you look from heaven, from Zion, graciously upon your people. And may you bless your people. Yes, sir. Lord, bless them. Lord, bless your people. Yes. Lord, bless your church. And keep them, Lord. That grace will be multiplied upon their people. Yes. That grace, every this grace of giving, will abound upon their people. Bless your church. Thank you, Father. To be all honor and all glory. Thank you, Lord. For in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you and Merry Christmas.